So the, the uh, previous session ended on a perfect note, which was we were talking about the biases. And, and what I want to tell you about is why we use public data. What is the advantage of using public data? So if you think about how we've been doing uh, uh, experimental science for, for uh, tens of years, for decades, is that we've been running these controlled experiments, and I call them uh, three Ts. We are controlling tissues, treatment, and technologies, because when, when you think about it, every sample comes from the same tissue, they are all treated equally, and and uh, they are profiled using the same technology. And, the, and, and once we, we generate this data, we, we, uh, uh, we look at our data, and then we are generating this hypothesis. But the problem is that this data does not, this controlled experiment does not capture the heterogeneity of a disease. And, and that's why once you have a, a conclusion from your studies and once you publish them before you can take them to clinic, you actually have to validate them into multiple independent cohorts, and sometimes we call them uh, uh, randomized controlled trials. Uh, the problem with this approach is that it's expensive and it's slow because you have to replicate it many number of times. <coughs> so why public data? Because if you look at um, uh, public data, uh, the advantage there is it's really heterogeneous. The, the people who have generated data for the same disease or the same condition or what have you, they've they've usually not talked to each other. They are usually competitors, so they don't talk to each other. Um, uh, because you cannot publish the uh, 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 same sort of paper again, and then the impact goes down, there are usually slight modifications, which, which again introduces heterogeneity in, in, uh, in the data that's available. And, and this data comes from different hospitals, different centers, different, uh, different countries. So, so that introduces not just treatment pro, uh, heterogeneity, but also biological heterogeneity, and, and that's useful because we really want to understand how a disease or a condition uh, manifests uh, uh, itself in, in, uh, in a different demographics. And then everybody uses different technologies. So again, the technology itself is a confounding factor, and, and if we can somehow use all of this data that's publicly available, then, then we can better represent the heterogeneity of a disease um, uh, uh, because the data is already available, it's, it's really very inexpensive. In, in, in some sense, it's, it's, uh, it's free to use, and, and it's really fast to, to collect all of this data. The problem is, how do you integrate this data? Because um, uh, uh, we've been uh, thought to think about uh, 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 controlling different confounding factors, and, and, and what you see here is, uh, every confounding factor that you can think of is, is, uh, is represented in, 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 the, in, in this publicly available data. So, um, so that's one thing, why use public data? And the second, uh, why study immune response? So this was uh, Charles Liu, a high school student in my group uh, um, last year, who collected 173 data sets. So he, he manually went through 173 data sets from 42 diseases and over 8,500 human samples. So all of the data that you see here is, is uh, from human sample, clinical studies. And, and he applied this framework that we have uh, we, we've, we've developed that allows you to take all of this very heterogeneous data into single analysis and identify robust disease signatures. So for every, every one of these 42 diseases, there were at least two data sets that he collected from independent sources. And, and he identified a disease signature for every one of these diseases and, and uh, then did a simple disease-by-disease disease correlation using a spearman, the simplest possible thing that you can imagine. And he showed me this, this graph, and, and the first thing that jumped out to me, if, if you stare at this long enough, the first thing that jumped out to me was that they, all of these diseases clustered based on their immune response, the type of immune response. So you can see all the respiratory viral infections were in one cluster, and the autoimmune diseases that are thought to, have, that are thought to be triggered by, by, by viral infections were, were uh, uh, clustered uh, with respiratory viral infections. All the brain cancers and, and the neurodegenerative diseases were in their own cluster. So first I thought this is probably a tissue-specific uh, bias coming in, but if you think about it, we, a brain is an immune privilege organ, and, and there is a blood-brain barrier, and that's what is being captured here. Um, uh, there was another group of autoimmune diseases that, that uh, uh, looked very similar. Cancers were in their own category, and first I thought that was just cancer, and, and that's why it was separate. But what was really interesting, and I've highlighted this in, in blue, is uh, uh, HIV. And if you think about it, uh, uh, HIV didn't cluster with, with uh, viral infections, but it clustered with cancer because both, the, both of these diseases are immunosuppressive. We know that now, now we know that cancer... 
cancer uh, 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 suppresses immune response through PD, uh, PD-L1 and 2 that, that Nir was just talking about. That's, that's one of the mechanism. And then another cluster was uh, organ transplant. All of the organ transplant, heart, lung, liver, kidney, they all clustered together. And then there was um, uh, 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 bacterial infections, which was separate from viral infection, and we know that there are different pathways and so on. So this was very remarkable that just using this data, the, 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 the biggest component that fell out across all the diseases was immune response. So now, now that we have this information, how do we use this for really understanding diseases, understanding uh, uh, immune response? So, so here is the first example, uh, uh, why this is useful. So, so you notice in, on the previous slide that all organ transplants were, were uh, uh, clustered into their own cluster. But if you look in, in clinical practice, the diagnosis for organ transplants is different. So heart, lung, liver, kidney transplant patients get diagnosed. There are different diagnostic criteria and there are different treatment protocols. And, and um, uh, another thing when I was uh, starting to work in organ transplant uh, seven years ago, one thing I learned was that um, uh, uh, this was a study out of uh, Canada where they asked three pathologists in the same hospital to look at number of uh, uh, transplant biopsies and, and give the diagnosis without knowing what the other, diag- uh, other pathologist was going to say. And there were 75 slides out of 411 biopsies that uh, uh, all three pathologists looked at. And, and when I read the number, it was, it was very disappointing. Uh, there were only 12, sli- 12 biopsies that they all agreed on the diagnosis. That's a, that's a 16% agreement within pathologists at the same hospital. And, and that's where uh, we thought, could we, could we do something better? If, if, there is, if all the organ transplants look similarly during rejection from a molecular perspective, maybe there is a common mechanism, common module that, that drives organ uh, rejection. Maybe there, is, there are different targets, but ultimately it leads to, to common pathway. So, so this is the analysis. We, we collected a large, uh, 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 a few data sets from public domain. Every column here, if you think back to any uh, paper that you, you've read, you would notice that every column here is a biological confounding factor that we try to control. Instead, we intentionally try to introduce this biological, this confounding factors. Uh, there was a tissue confounding factor. The data came from seven hospitals in four different countries. There was technology confounding factor, all of that. And what we found was there was an 11 gene module that was uh, significantly uh, different across all organ transplants during acute rejection. And then using now completely independent cohorts, again, everything publicly available, we showed that using these 11 genes, not only we could diagnose uh, acute rejection across all organs as good as pathologists, we also showed that we could diagnose acute rejections or, or subclinical injury that happens to transplanted organs 18 months prior to pathologists across 12 different hospitals that have completely missed in the first two years of transplantation uh, uh, and, and always characterize or diagnose these patients as being uh, uh, stable. But then we went a step further. This could be just the uh, uh, association and not, not a causal. causal uh, 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 there was no uh, evidence that this module is also causing acute rejection. So we predicted two drugs, both FDA-approved, atorvastatin and dasatinib, and then using a mouse model, we showed that both of these drugs on their own extended graph survival in mouse model. Again, mouse is good. Well, how, how do we take this into humans? So then we took electronic medical records from Belgium of kidney transplant patients who were followed for up to eight years and showed that if those patients received one of our predicted drugs, statin, their graft failure rate was 30% lower than those who did not receive statin over eight year period. So if you think about it, just using public data except the mouse experiment to, to convince ourselves, we use only public data to find the signature that was common across multiple data sets is diagnostic, prognostic, therapeutic, and by extension, mechanistic. Now, this is one uh, a- example of how do we use all of this data to find uh, what's common in, uh, in inflammation. But then there is another problem. Now that we know that uh, uh, the inflammation looks different in different groups of diseases, can we start to understand uh, uh, and, and, and find signatures of inflammation that looks similar in clinic and then start identifying these, these signatures? And the biggest problem right now is, is sepsis. Uh, it's, the, it's the biggest healthcare expense in the United States. 
45% uh, of disease, uh, in hospital deaths are caused by sepsis, and, and this is uh, uh, the most staggering number that every hour of delay in diagnosing sepsis increases mortality by six to eight percent. So this is really every hour matters. And, and what is sepsis? Sepsis is, is the, the intersection uh, that you see uh, on the slide there, which is a systemic, a whole body inflammation caused by infection. So you could have whole body inflammation for, because of other reasons like burn or gunshot wound or, or trauma, uh, different kinds of trauma. But that's not what we are interested in. We are interested in looking for sepsis, uh, inf inflammation caused by, by uh, uh, infection. So uh, uh, Tim Sweeney, uh, uh, a very talented postdoc in my group, uh, uh, took on on this really uh, a huge challenge. He collected every clinical study that he could find. He, uh, he collected about 27 uh, data sets, more than 2,900 samples, all coming from human, uh, and then 1,600 patients. So this was really large data set he collected. And the first thing that he found, the first insight he had was that across all the data sets that he collected from many different hospitals, they all uh, uh, ch followed the same trajectory. Patients came in on day one, and then they, uh, by the time they, they left the hospital on around uh, somewhere between uh, three to uh, five weeks, they, they followed this nonlinear trajectory. And, and, and what, was, what was the benefit of this insight? The, the advantage was now we realize that if you take a patient who comes in hospital on, on day zero and you try to predict any biomarker of sepsis by comparing the same patient on, on, on day 10, most of the time what you are going to find is the, the signature of recovery, and that's not really useful. What you really need to do is account for this time, this recovery that's happening while they are in hospital, and then, and then try to find biomarkers. Um, so long story short, and there is a lot on, on this slide, so without going into too much detail, what he found was once he account for time, so he grouped patients based on, based on, on when they uh, came in the hospital and, 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 and how far along they were in the hospital, what he found was that the red line, uh, the pink uh, uh, box plot shows you the patients who were in hospital and never received a diagnosis of, of infection, so they, were, they did not have sepsis. And the darkest blue tells you the patients within 24 hours of, of diagnosis of rejection. And you could see that they were, they were different, but what was really interesting and what was really remarkable was he could see this trend two to five days before the clinical diagnosis of rejection. And, and that is, that is uh, uh, very significant because instead of now hours, we can, we can uh, identify patients who are at a risk of of uh, 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 a sepsis two to five days earlier, monitor them and, and, and administer antibiotic uh, uh, at the first sign and, and, and uh, hopefully save uh, uh, lives. So, uh, so I showed you how we can identify common signatures of uh, inflammation across many different organs. How can we identify uh, 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 small differences between different types of inflammation? And, and, but that was looking for similarity. What about differences? So that was this, the, the most strongly anti-correlated point on this uh, uh, correlation uh, map that, that Charles uh, created was multiple sclerosis and uh, 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 HIV. And it was very interesting. Uh, a long story short, when we looked into the literature, it turns out in electronic, if you look in electronic medical records, if you have HIV and you are being treated, your risk of multiple sclerosis goes down significantly. It's about 30%. And, and uh, so, so this is, this is the, uh, now this was just one example. Why not we do this for all the diseases and all the, study, uh, all the diseases that we have data for and we can get our hands on electronic medical records. So this is a work that's going on with, with uh, uh, Nigam Shah at Stanford where we are looking, comparing all the diseases that we have curated and, and uh, um, uh, uh, looking at the electronic medical records in Stanford Hospital to understand uh, what are the similar diseases that we also observe in, in the clinics. And, and, and this is my last slide. And this data doesn't belong to us, so we are getting ready to pr uh, uh, release all of the, this curated data with all the analytics uh, publicly available. And what really excites us is, although this is, each one of these studies is, is, uh, is uh, small data, uh, we can combine them very quickly, inexpensively, to create a big data that, that allows us to identify diagnosis and, and, and therapies. And with that, I, I want to thank everybody in my lab, the funding sources, and thank you. Very good.